I'm an associate professor in the electrical and computer engineering department, and um, my particular research is in photonics. It's one of the uh, five or so areas that we focus on in the electrical and computer engineering department. Um, if you're interested about uh, more about what I do, there's a link there for my group's website. You can learn a little more about that. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about some of uh, my research today, and uh, but I'll also take you through sort of an overview of Johns Hopkins University and uh, the engineering school and then the electrical and computer engineering department. Um, we also have two um, PhD students in our department here today, uh, Gaspar and Sayak. They'll be available to answer questions. They're also talk a little bit about um, living in uh, the area uh, as a graduate student and um, things like that. So, um, so all right, the electrical and computer engineering department is part of the Whiting School of Engineering, and that's the first part of Johns Hopkins University. Um, Johns Hopkins is a very large um, research uh, institution. Um, and for 37 years, for example, we have led uh, the U.S. in um, spending on research. Um, so we have a lot of uh, research activities at Johns Hopkins University. Um, there's nine divisions, uh, including the Wedding School of Engineering, um, the School of Arts and Sciences, the Kruger School. Um, we have a university-affiliated research center, which is the Applied Physics Lab, which is nearby. And there, there's a large number of engineers and scientists that work on mostly uh, defense-related research, but also um, things funded by, for example, NASA and um, health-related research. Um, we also, of course, have a very well-known uh, School of Medicine that's nearby to the campus here, and um, School of Public Health, and those other divisions. Um, I listed these five because uh, the School of Arts and Sciences, Applied Physics Lab, and School of Medicine and School of Public Health are, are common places where people in our department will um, collaborate with researchers in those other divisions. Um, yeah. So, <clears throat> Uh, the School of Engineering um, is, uh, as far as engineering schools go, maybe maybe a little bit smaller than many other schools, uh, um, which has its benefits. Um, we have about 1,600 graduate students, uh, 1,800 undergraduate students, and we also have a part-time program, and we have about 2,500 part-time students um, in the graduate program. Uh, we have 181 faculty, uh, academic faculty, and 31 research faculty, uh, around 30 teaching faculty, and also um, research scientists and engineers that make up, you know, the, the employees here, um, research-related employees here. Um, we have nine PhD programs in the School of Engineering, 14 master's programs. We also have a large number of part-time master's programs, about 21, and some of that is um, online. So we have about 16 online programs. And of course, all of those uh, different programs are available to you if you're interested in coming here. Um, the Whiting School is you know, highly ranked um, in both the US and in the world in terms of um, engineering schools. And so, for example, we were uh, ranked number 19 in 2018 in the US News uh, uh, rankings. Um, so today I'm talking about uh, the master's and PhD programs in the electrical and computer engineering department, it's the department that I'm in. Um, and I didn't know this actually before preparing this presentation, but actually electrical engineering is the oldest engineering discipline at Johns Hopkins, which I found kind of interesting. It started uh, back in 1887 with a program that was started by a physics professor in applied electricity. And um, since then, um, in about 1913, there was a formation of an engineering uh, program and electrical engineering was one of the original uh, areas of engineering that, that was at Hopkins and that started around 1913. So it's, Electrical engineering has, has been here for a very long time. We've had lots of you know, people over, over time that have been you know, very famous in their fields in electrical engineering at, at Johns Hopkins. Um, today we have uh, about 21 uh, tenure track engineering faculty in our department. And these 21 people work in various areas, including imaging, machine learning, control sensors, microsystems, robotics, and photonics. So we try to sort of spread ourselves over all the various areas of electrical engineering. However, we do have a relatively small department compared to a lot of institutions, so we tend to also focus in, in certain areas, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, we have about five to 10 postdoctoral researchers in the department, and about 56 master's students and 112 PhD students. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, so I've, I've mentioned that um, 
Johns Hopkins is a, is a very large you know, research institution and we have, we uh, routinely lead uh, the U.S. In, in research spending, but at the same time, I'm saying, you know, we have a small department, which kind of maybe is counterintuitive, uh, but that's one of the things that I really like about Johns Hopkins is being in the electrical and computer engineering department and in the engineering school in general uh, is a smaller field, and you get to know everyone. Um, you have a lot of say in what goes on, and things like that. It's kind of more like a small school from that perspective, but we also have a lot of resources available to us due to the, to the large nature of, of the institution in general, including the medical school, applied physics labs, et cetera. So there are lots of opportunities, but uh, it's, it's a relatively small feel in, in our particular department, which is nice from that perspective. Um, on the right of the screen, you can see the building that electrical engineering is, and computer engineering is, um, is in. It's in Barton Hall here, and that's a picture in the spring showing uh, some of the beautiful trees on our campus blooming. Um, and down at the bottom is just pictures of various uh, people in the department at, at various events. Um, our academic program, we have, for graduate uh, programs, we have both a, a PhD program and a master's program. Um, the master's program has two different options about how we, uh, how you can get a master's. Um, you can either do purely just coursework uh, or you can do coursework uh, combined with uh, some research. So the table below uh, explains a little bit about the requirements and, and the typical uh, time to completion for, for these different programs. Um, the PhD program, we typically require about 10 courses to be completed by our doctoral students. Uh, of course, the focus of the PhD program is not as much on coursework as it is on the individual's research. So by the end of the PhD program, we produce you know, a dissertation and that's the main requirement to get your PhD. Um, so after taking these courses, usually in the first couple of years, uh, you, most PhD students primarily focus on their dissertation research. Um, it takes about five years usually for, for people to graduate from our PhD program. And there are a few different exams that we administer throughout uh, those five years, including a qualifying exam, which is taken after about um, two years. Um, what's what we call a GBO or graduate board oral exam. That's a, that's a university wide uh, exam where we get people from outside the department to come and participate. And that's taken somewhere in the first two or three years. And then by the end of the um, five years, approximately, you would then defend your thesis. Um, for masters, we, like I said, we have two options. We either have a coursework only masters or we have um, coursework plus research. Uh, the benefit of the, the research is both you get some experience with research, which is nice and a little bit different often from an undergraduate degree, um, but also we reduce the amount of coursework that you have to do. So if you do a master's uh, with, a re with a research project, you uh, are required to take eight courses, uh, whereas a master's with just coursework is, is 10 courses. Um, uh, of course, more information you can visit this uh, link at the bottom of the, of the page here um, to our, our page on graduate studies on our website. Um, I mentioned earlier that we try to cover many areas of electrical engineering, but we have a relatively small department. So we, we also focus in, in specific areas. Um, our five areas that we focus in are listed here. Um, they are controls, uh, networks and systems, uh, image and signal processing, with a lot of people working in language and speech processing. Um, we also have a number of faculty in microsystems and computer engineering, and then uh, my area, which is solid state electronics and photonics. So uh, in each of these five areas, we have nominally you know, five or so faculty working in these different areas uh, that make up our roughly 20 plus faculty in the department. Um, one of the really nice things about having a relatively small electrical engineering department compared to many other schools is that uh, we get to know each other very well, and I talk to a lot of people outside of my discipline, right? So a lot of other universities that are comparable to us in, in sort of research stature, um, there may be 20 plus people just working in photonics, and so people tend to get sort of focused on their areas, and they don't talk a lot with people outside of their particular area. Um, our department's very different, right? We have a relatively small department, and um, I get to talk and learn about these other interesting areas, cutting edge areas of electrical engineering on a regular basis. And that really promotes collaboration, I think, in our department. Um, I'll give you one example of a project I'm working on right now with a number of other faculty in the department 
but uh, there's many, many, many examples that can be given of how we work together and how we learn about these uh, disparate areas of electrical engineering uh, very easily in, in, in the smaller environment. Um, the one example from my research that I thought might be interesting to talk about today is this project that um, is a collaboration between me, uh, Professor Amy Foster, uh, Professor Brent Cooper, and Professor Najim Behak. And uh, me and, and Professor Amy Foster, we work primarily in photonics. Um, Amy focuses on sort of the physics of photonic devices and uh, photonic integration. Uh, I work more at a systems level with photonic systems. And uh, then there are Professor Cooper and Professor Dehak. Um, they work, uh, well, Professor Cooper works in area of communications, and Professor Dehak works in uh, speech recognition and machine learning. And you may wonder how all these different areas can kind of come together in one project. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what we've been working on is trying to create a physical key that cannot be uh, hacked. So a physical key is just like, uh, you would expect like a, like a key to your house or your car. It's a physical object that contains some sort of secret information that identifies you as, as the proper person who has, should have access to that environment or, or, or so on. And uh, we want to create one that has two properties, one that you can't copy. Um, so unlike a regular key that you can take you know, to a hardware store and get a copy made, we want to make a key that's impossible to copy. And we want to make a key that you can't even emulate, even if you know everything about how it works. Um, and so the interesting thing about that is if you produce a key like that, is that there's no longer any need for any secret information about the key, right? Somebody can, can look at the key, they can analyze it, they can uh, know everything about it, but they still can't create a copy or produce something that appears to be the key in any fashion. Um, unlike a, a, a key for your car or something like that, our key is optical. Uh, we send, and a picture of it's at the bottom of the screen here, it's a little, uh, micro resonator, uh, and we send light into this resonator, and it bounces around inside this cavity. That's a SEM image of, of the micro resonator. Uh, and a little bit of the light leaks out uh, each time around the cavity. And we analyze the way in which the light comes out of the cavity after we send it in. And from that signature that comes out, we can identify this as a legitimate device or, or, or not a legitimate device. Um, Small little imperfections, and well, what people often think of as imperfections, something that we actually desire, but small little idiosyncrasies, I should say, in the device give it its unique signature. And that's what we use to determine that it's the, the legitimate device. Um, and so we've done the experiment where we actually make copies of this device and look to see if, if we can differentiate it from one from another. And we can see that on the right is how we, we analyze that using something known as fractional hamming distance. Um, the red curve is the values for the legitimate device, and the green curve shows it for uh, exact copies. And what we see is that we can, we have about a one in one trillion chance of being able to produce a copy. So we consider that fairly unclonable or not being able to be copied. Um, so back to the various areas of research and how this all fits in together. So um, Professor Amy Foster uh, makes these devices, right? They, they focus on photonic integration. They make these kind of devices, they analyze them at a device level, how they work. I work in, in how we can send the light in and take it out and get useful information from that. Uh, Professor Cooper works in, in how uh, information itself is encoded in, on things, uh, less from a hardware perspective. And Professor Dayhawk works on machine learning and speech recognition, which is maybe the, the least seemingly related to this project. But remember, one of the things we desired was that the key could not be emulated. And one of the ways in which you could emulate this device is if you could send in uh, light and receive it on the output and, and send a lot of different um, examples in and out, you may be able to produce a model for how it behaves. And those models are exactly the types of things that, that he works on. Typically, he's trying to identify speech. But in this case, he's trying to identify the, way, the physics of how this device operates using the exact same algorithms. Uh, and so I think that brings really a very interesting aspect to this research in, in, in how, whether a computer can understand the physics, even though we don't have the ability to directly model it at a sufficiently high level. Um, so maybe that gives you a little bit of a feel for how we can work on very interdisciplinary areas. Um, one last thing I guess I should mention, you, know, you may wonder, why you would want such a key. <laughs> uh, why you would want a key that you can't make a copy of, it seems a little bit risky, right? Um, one example of why this is interesting is 
uh, people want to be able to put device, like um, signatures on a, a piece of electronic hardware that can't be duplicated such that they can avoid um, uh, people making counterfeit hardware. So the idea is that there's a large market right now for counterfeit hardware and we want to be able to say, okay, this hardware is, is authentic. Uh, and one approach to doing so would be to put a device like this, package it on top of the electronics with everything else, and it's a device that can't be duplicated. Therefore, if someone wants to make a counterfeit, there's no way that they could create a counterfeit version of this device that, that would pass any kind of uh, tests. Um, so now I just wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about what the experience of being a student in our department is like. So to, to begin with, I wanted to talk about what it's like to live in Baltimore. Um, on the left there, you see a picture of Baltimore's Inner Harbor. It's really a wonderful place to go and hang out. Um, and there's lots of fun things to do there, uh, including, for example, baseball games uh, at Oriole Park. There's a football stadium. We, uh, in the city, we have lots of other arts activities. I, I just showed, for example, the Meyerhoff Symphony Hall on the right here. Um, so there's many of these opportunities available. Uh, in addition, Baltimore is on the Northeast Rail Corridor of Amtrak, so it's very easy to travel from Baltimore to lots of other um, big cities on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, it's only 45 minutes down to Washington, D.C., two and a half hours on the train up to New York City. You can go all the way up to Boston and maybe further, I'm not sure. I've even taken the train all the way down to Georgia, although it takes a little bit longer to get down there. Um, there's lots of great things to eat in Baltimore. We were ranked as the number two food city in the US in 2015 by Zagat. And um, there's also a lot of sort of tech activities in, in Baltimore that have been starting up, both due to the university and other factors. Um, so, for example, Entrepreneur Magazine recently rated Baltimore as uh, one of the nation's hot startup cities. And in particular, the engineering school has really had a focus on startup and tech transfer in the last, I'd say, um, five or so years, trying to increase our presence in, in, in sort of that area. And so I think a lot of those opportunities are coming online now, and they'll be available to you as a student uh, here in the engineering school. Um, so we have lots of the benefits of being in a large urban center, but one of the nice things about Baltimore too is that it's very easy to get out of the city if you want to. So I, on the right I show uh, some examples. Um, the Appalachian Trail, which is a long hiking trail from I believe Georgia up to Maine, uh, runs through the state of Maryland, is not very far from Baltimore, so there's lots of hiking activities and things like that available both there and in state parks throughout the, the, the state. Uh, and these are all very close, really, to Baltimore. You can drive there very quickly. We're also on this huge body of water on the east coast of the Chesapeake Bay, so there's lots of opportunities for, for getting out of the city and doing fun things uh, that are bay-related, both sort of beach areas and boating and things like that. Um, at this time, I wanted some of the, the grad students that are on, on the call here to talk a little bit about living. So I, I listed a few of the different places here that I'm aware of, but maybe they can speak a little bit more uh, to this point. Uh, hi, my name is Gaspar. Um, I'm a fifth year PhD student in the and Girls Lab. I'm from Argentina, graduated in uh, 2012 in Argentina, worked for a little bit, and then came to Hopkins to do some research. Uh, I'm doing research in microelectronics. Uh, it's very nice to work here, mainly because we're pretty close to the School of Medicine, so we get to work with doctors, and so particularly I am working on implantable devices. Uh, uh, that go in the ear, so for a vestibular uh, implant. Uh, it's pretty exciting, and uh, hopefully you would enjoy it probably. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Stayak. I uh, joined uh, the PhD program in 2014. Before that, I did my undergrad back in India, and came directly after that. So I've been, uh, this is my fourth year now, I've, I work with Dr. Pablo Iglesias in control systems. So uh, what we do is we try and control cell dynamics, like the different processes that cells do, like cell division, cell migration, these type of things. So we try, try to set up models for them and try to control them um, based on how these dynamics change. So regarding the housing uh, facilities, I guess um, the, the places that are on here are amongst the best places to live if you're a grad student here. For example, uh, Charles Village, I, I myself have stayed in Charles Village and near Remington for a while. And these are like maybe like two minutes to three minutes walking distance to campus. And you have lots of like cool places around, shops nearby. These are quite good places to live. Hamden 
I guess, might be a little bit more expensive compared to Charles Williams Remington. But again, that's not an understatement. It's one of the hottest places to live. It's, it has like, you have like a bunch of stores and it's a very happening nightlife at that type of region. Yeah, I live uh, in a neighborhood called Mount Vernon. It's a little bit closer to town. A lot of people choose it because it's a little bit cheaper. Uh, you get a little bit bigger space for less money. And it's it's pretty nice actually because uh, it's probably a 10 minute bus ride. There's a free Hopkins bus uh, every 10, 15 minutes that drives back and forth from the Pullman campus to the medical uh, campus. Uh, and so that's how I, I get to work or either that or I take a bike. Um, there's a nice bike path that goes all the way from town, all the way up to campus. That's uh, reserved lanes for biking, so that's that's pretty nice. Okay, thank you. But I'll move on to the, the next uh, topic here. So you may wonder um, where <coughs> our uh, graduates uh, end up. Um, so our graduates end up in, in various research and development positions as well as academic positions. So on this slide, I'm just listing all the different um, research and development positions that we could accumulate for this presentation. I'm sure there's probably more than this, but this gives you an idea, you know, this is the mark all over uh, the map in, in sort of electrical engineering and, and beyond. Um, as far as academic positions, these are some of our recent graduates that have gone on to academic positions at these institutions. So, uh, again, um, lots of uh, very high profile institutions that our, that our graduates end up uh, teaching at or, or doing research at. Um, in terms of the, the being admitted to the, to the programs, um, here I'm just listing some of the admissions information for the Masters of Science. Um, so we give some examples of like what scores on various you know, standardized tests and things like that, uh, GPAs and whatnot that a typical successful applicant has. So you can sort of compare yourself to these. Or of course, this is just uh, a tool for you to gauge. It's, it's not, these aren't hard requirements. Okay, we look at each uh, applicant individually when we're, when we're doing admissions. Um, here's the, the similar information for the PhD program. Um, again, we, we, for each applicant, we, we look at each applicant on an individual basis. Uh, so these aren't hard and fast rules, but just give you an idea of typically what we're looking for, typically what uh, the profile of a student is that gets into our program. Um, the application process itself, um, the deadline is December 15th for both the PhD and the MSc programs. Um, you need to complete the online application, you need to write a statement of purpose and get three letters of recommendation. Uh, you need to do GREs and TOEFL if that applies. And uh, we also need, of course, transcripts uh, all to be uploaded through the application uh, interface. Um, if you have any questions or concerns about applying, uh, the contact for that would be Debbie Race, uh, who coordinates the, the application process, uh, and her phone and e email are listed there. Um, after the deadline of the 15th, we, we then, as a faculty, review um, the PhD applications and the MSc applications, and we'll then send out um, offers of admission to the admitted students. And at this point, I guess we'll wrap up the online uh, session here, and thank you all for attending and, and for your interest in uh, our department. Uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to email me or any other, other people listed 